So what is it like to work in, in Canadian intelligence and produce products that might help decision makers make decisions? Hi, this is Phil Gursky, President and CEO of Borealis Threat Risk Consulting in Russell, Canada. You're listening to Canadian Intelligence, a podcast about intelligence and national security. As I think I've mentioned on several occasions, I did spend more than three decades, 32 years in intelligence uh, in Canada, working in both signals intelligence and human intelligence as an analyst. And so I have been, been around a little bit in terms of the production of intelligence, collection, distribution, talking to clients, etc. But I decided to bring in someone today who has uh, an equal, equally interesting career in intelligence. Uh, Greg Fife, who was the head of the Privy Council Office Intelligence Assessment Secretary for a long time. And that's where I met him and has been very active in his so-called retirement. He's been about retired as I have been, I think, since he left the federal government. So, Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Phil. So let's let, maybe you can walk my listeners through, Greg, your actual experience in intelligence in Canada over your career. Well, my career in intelligence is much shorter than yours, although um, my post, I could add to that, my uh, my post-retirement, as you say, so-called retirement career. But I had been um, ADM in a couple departments, mostly on policy, and I was ADM immigration. And I got the chance to succeed the previous head of the IAS. I had had a bit of exposure to uh, an interdepartmental committee on intelligence, and I, I had some knowledge of intelligence, but I didn't really have any experience in the community. So I came into the uh, PCOIS in uh, about the end of March 2000, and I was there for eight years as a head of it. And uh, it was an interesting experience because uh, I had to give myself a crash course in intelligence, uh, and I had to learn as much as I could, as fast as I could, about what made intelligence assessment successful and uh, where it where it was useful to decision makers. So in the course of that time, I got to know a lot of the Canadian community. I got to deal with people in the five eyes. So I learned how other countries were dealing with their intelligence systems and their intelligence challenges. So it was an interesting period. It was initially a learning experience, but I found uh, that I did have some backgrounds that were useful. Uh, I had a sense of what decision makers needed, what form it should come in, uh, how it should be written. Uh, and I could get a sense of whether it was being useful to people or not. And really the, the challenge is to make sure that what you do in assessment is actually directly useful to decision makers. And that's a process of learning. It's also a process of evolution, the process of getting the right people, identifying the topics. So I think we made progress during my period, and I think my successors have continued to make a lot of pros, uh, progress to the point where the system is uh, much more effective and focused now than it was when I left. Now, so the so the Privy Council Office Intelligence Assessment Secretary, PCOIS, as, you, as, as we call it, had a bit of a history. If memory serves me correct, it actually used to be part of foreign affairs or external affairs or whatever that department was called way back in the 1990s. And it moved to the Privy Council office in, in I believe, in 92, if memory serves me correct. Do you think that uh, having an intelligence um, arm or a sort of a, a, a central bureau for intelligence assessment within the Privy Council was the right move at the time and get it out of foreign affairs? Is it is it more sort of central to government in that in that sense? Yeah, and it's it's got counterparts in our five eyes uh, countries. There's in most of them, there's some sort of counterpart that's under the, the central government agencies. Certainly in Australia, New Zealand, and Britain, it's pretty close in a general parallel sense to what we ended up doing. The U.S. is a bit different, obviously, because it's a presidential system, right. but ultimately the same thing applies. I think it's important because uh, you want you want a form of strategic intelligence to be fairly close to senior people in government. But you also don't want uh, your uh, intelligence assessment to be too closely associated with policy departments who might want the assessments to turn out the way uh, their policies uh, are aimed. So you need a neutral assessment agency that's prepared to say th this is the way it is, mm -hmm. uh, exclusive, exclusive of what the policy objectives are. It's not our job to advise on policy. It's not our job to 
tell you that your policy objectives have or have not been met. It's our job to provide decision makers with a neutral, intelligence-based or informed background that says this is the situation. You may not like it, you may like it, but before you start your discussions, you are entitled to a neutral assessment of what's actually going on. Would you call that speaking truth to power or is that a phrase that's kind of hackneyed? It doesn't really apply here. No, I don't think it's quite truth to power, although there's an aspect of it there. Truth to power also usually includes policy advice to uh, to ministers and others, but it is truth to power in the sense that you say, this is the way it is. Uh, it's And that has not been too much of a challenge in the Privy Council office in providing uh, that kind of advice because that advice doesn't become public. It's when public, when advice becomes public, that politicians are sensitive to what they're being told and what's going to get out of what they're being told. Um, but you, you do need to have that ability to say this is the way it is. And we've seen in some other countries that that doesn't quite work or doesn't work the way it used to. Right. Now, you referred to some of our allies. You know, you talk about Australia, New Zealand, uh, United Kingdom, of course, the Americans, uh, some of whom have much, much larger intelligence efforts than, than we here in Canada. Of course, the Americans always seem to do things on a much grander scale than we do. I've always gotten the impression, and I'm curious if you would agree with me, that especially in the United Kingdom and the United States, and I think to a, probably a larger extent in Australia as well, that they have a better appreciation for what intelligence can and cannot do, and therefore have a much more robust intelligence culture in their governments. I, I've always gotten the impression throughout my career that we in Canada, uh, we had good intelligence agencies, and we certainly had good clients, and we had good processes, but I never walked away with the impression that for most people in government, they really saw intelligence as a critical part of policymaking and decision making. Would you agree or disagree with me on that? Uh, I would agree, but I think it's changing. Uh, the United Kingdom has traditionally been uh, an intelligence power. It started developing its modern intelligence system at the turn of the last century, uh, in the early the early 1900s. The U.S. became a major intelligence power after the Second World War. Australia uh, has had to pay attention to uh, intelligence because uh, its land mass is at the he at the end of a long chain of islands, which were occupied, for example, by the Japanese during the Second World War, to the point where uh, Darwin Harbour in northern Australia was repeatedly bombed. Right. So, knowing knowing uh, having a, a robust intelligence function, which which is driven by military needs in part and driven by possible subversion in parts is absolutely necessary. Uh, we've had a more protected status and uh, intelligence has not played quite the same role because we don't have quite the same threat array. The reason I say it's changing is that a lot of threats now are global, international, right. they're cyber, they're uh, different kinds of subver subversion that are nurtured internationally and across the internet and so on. So our risk profile is beginning to look more like the risk profile of a lot of our partners. One of the results of that is that more departmental agencies and government uh, have an intelligence function. And I think the role of intelligence is gradually increasing across government. I'm glad to hear that, um, that you have a, that perspective on things, because I always felt that, that there should be more uh, attention paid. Obviously, you know, having spent three decades in the business, I'm, I'm obviously biased in that regard. But you still come across these stories once in a while where, for example, the director of CSIS will come out and say something, uh, say, for example, about Chinese interference in Canada. And if you recall way back, well, way back a decade ago, when Dick Fadden, the then CSIS director, talked about Chinese interference in, in the political system, he was roundly criticized and, and told to basically, you know, shut his mouth and not talk about these things. The current director, David Vigneault, essentially reiterated the same thing a few months ago. And I didn't see the reaction as quite as negative from some government circles. So and in your mind, does this sort of point to this acknowledgement that intelligence, in fact, uh, is important and that it can it can help inform government people? Uh, I I think it's the nature nature of the threats, uh, the nature of the past. There was a sense, I think, in a lot of government in the past that uh, our intelligence apparatus was too close to the U.S. and it was in, it was uh, soaked in American perspectives about global affairs and intelligence, and that was probably too true to at least a degree. 
and there was lots of competition, especially for strategic intelligence. I think when uh, Dick Fadden came out with his statement, uh, when he was the head of CSIS, uh, people who were in intelligence knew that he was raising a very serious and valid problem. But it was also a difficult problem to lo- to, to raise because um, a lot of aspects of being uh, an agent of influence are very hard to detect. They're nuanced. They may right. not be Ill- illegal at all. They, they may be against the interests of Canada. But that doesn't make them necessarily illegal. I think one of the things that's happened is that uh, Chinese tactics uh, globally, but also through the National Front, have become much more obvious. And people are much more aware of the organization behind uh, Chinese influence campaigns. Uh, there are still criticisms when people raise what amounts to suggestions that somebody or somebody is an, an agent of influence. But those who are in the intelligence community know that this is an explicit and well-funded and quite effective uh, arm of uh, outreach of, of uh, Chinese foreign policy. Do you think then that on some occasions, at least for some people, that the message only really hits when something really bad happens? So I'm not talking. I'm not. I'm not talking about terrorism. Here. Let's stick with agents of influence. If it becomes very obvious that in fact that Canada has been significantly penetrated and infiltrated by a foreign power for that foreign power's interests, is that when people start paying attention? Then uh, I think it's. It's not, I don't think they perceive it on such a grand scale, but they perceive individual incidents. I think everyone knows that uh, the cyber theft theft of intellectual property was a factor in the downfall of Nortel. Uh, Articles about uh, universities cooperating on strategic uh, technological uh, research with Chinese agencies is, is in papers now on a regular basis. I think there are more reporters who are covering uh, foreign policy and defense from uh, an intelligence angle. Uh, there's a lot more been written on intelligence. Um, and I think I think the government is better organized around it. I don't think we're nearly as sensitive yet as, as some other uh, countries. But I think the fact that we have constant cyber attacks, we have constant ransomware attacks, we know that some countries uh, protect cyber criminals, um, what, what is going on internationally with um, moves by Russia and China is in the paper every day. And a lot of them, of course, have intelligence uh, uh, dimensions to them. So I, th- I think for unfortunate reasons, the consciousness of Canadians around intelligence issues is probably uh, increasing substantially. Do you find it interesting as well that, you know, so your career coincided with pretty well with 9-11, just before 9-11 happened. And we both know that from an intelligence perspective here in Canada, uh, counterterrorism really ruled the roost for the better part of two decades. It's not that we didn't do counterintelligence and other counterproliferation, for example, but the the collection and analysis priority was definitely on the terrorism side because of what had just happened. Is this sort of like a return to the old days then? Because we all know that, of course, you know, when, when, when I joined CSE in 1983, uh, it was still during the Cold War and the Soviets were still the number one enemy and, and Soviet influence was the concern. Are we sort of going back to our, I don't know, to our origins in a way with looking at Russia and, and now China as sort of the predominant threats? The most recent CSE public report opened with China, which I found was a curious departure from from recent public reports where terrorism what was ruling the roost so are, are we sort of returning to what we used to do and then are you concerned that either we're trying to do too much with too few resources or that it's hard to prioritize what your intelligence collection and reporting should be on in the first place well i think i think one of the truisms of intelligence is that it's it's you, you constantly acquire new threats uh, which doesn't mean that you lose old ones so uh, the Cold War, in a sense, seems to be reviving after a period in the 90s when it looked like there was a good chance of cooperative relationships yeah, with exactly, Russia. Yeah. Uh, the cooperative relationship with China has turned into an antagonistic one. Uh, we did get extra resources, uh, substantial extra resources across the community in, after 9-11, and we boosted substantially our capacity, not only in anti-terrorism, but in, in a number of fronts. Uh, for for the for the part of the IS, I think the fact that we had a pretty much um, correct call on Iraq uh, increased the credibility of uh, Canadian intelligence. 
But I think what we face now is we have um, Russia revived as a threat, China as a, a very substantial threat. And frankly, we just don't know about terrorism. Terrorism has been diminished to a degree during the pandemic. And a lot of the, a lot of the battlefields around terrorism have changed, particularly with more government control of uh, Syria. Um, but ISIS is still around, Al Qaeda is still around, mm -hmm. uh, and we now have a new threat of a new kind of domestic terrorism mm -hmm. uh, with extremist groups and, and conspiracy theorists. So, uh, do we need more resources? Well, uh, I have I have uh, experience in a lot of government departments, and we always want more yeah, exactly. uh, resources, and we always have good reason for wanting more resources because we have a, a mandate on which we don't want to fail because we don't do things we should be doing. I, I think I, I think it's very difficult to see substantial new resources coming into the intelligence yeah. community, even though I think there's a strong need for them, because the government is is prioritizing expenditures in several other directions. Right. There is an overlap in many of these directions, though, with intelligence. Uh, you can't currently you cannot defend um, your economic viability without. Uh, without building bridges between the intelligence community and the private sector for cyber defense, for example. So some of these things will come together, um, but we will be in a period of constrained resources mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because of other expenditure priorities. So as much as I hope that the intelligence community gets the resources it needs, it may not get the resources that it feels it needs. Yeah, I've been arguing, you know, especially in the post, whatever post COVID looks like, the, you know, the government has spent uh, tremendously in terms of keeping the economy going, as you alluded to, and is, you know, trillions of dollars in debt right now. And it'd be pretty hard to make the argument on the cabinet table that your intelligence people should get, get more cash, uh, given that, you know, the fact that the government's bottom line is, is in some danger. You've alluded on a few occasions, Greg, to sort of the intelligence community writ large in Canada. And I think that most people would not realize just how extensive it is. They probably think, you know, it's CSC, it's CSIS. Most people probably haven't heard of PCOIS. They probably think, you know, the RCMP has an intelligence function as well as a law enforcement one. Overall, in your time in, in, in intelligence in Canada, how do you feel the community uh, cooperated and collaborated? Do you think it was a, a, a mature effort at working together or do you think there was there was a competition on, on occasion to do certain things what was your overall impression of the community in the time you were there well when i came in in 2000 uh, a lot of the the divisions in in the community were obvious uh, there were different relations uh, between uh, different uh, different departments that i think now cooperate much more closely CSIS was still a relatively young organization um, cse was was growing but there was a lot of competition uh, between different different agencies for you know credit for different different kinds of products. I think 9/11 changed a lot of that, just like it changed the nature of the Five Eyes Alliance. Uh, even when I left, though, it was it was you could see progress in the degree of cooperation, but you could also see where there was there were difficulties at times. And this is this is kind of natural. Uh, I think the, the UK community is probably the best integrated and the Australians are not far behind, but the American community is divided all over the place. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I, when I left, I felt that the community had made a lot of progress. We, we, we had the, the extra resources. We had a more focused mandate. Um, we had the uh, advent of the National Security Advisor. Um, so I felt there'd been a lot of progress. Um, when I when I teach now, I teach, uh, I'm one of the facilitators for a course on intelligence leadership. Some of the same words come up, you know, we're too divided, we're not mm -hmm. focused, we need a whole of government mandate uh, approach. Um, and I feel, you know, you've, you, you really aren't aware of how much progress has been made. Um, but there's still a ways to go. Um, in particular, I did some research a little while ago because I wrote a chapter for the book, um, uh, The Secret Canada, which looked at different departments and how they handle the intelligence function. So I interviewed a lot of people around what had changed in PCO. And there's been an enormous growth of, um, I think, apparently quite effective uh, DM and ADM committees, ministerial consultations. Um, so there's a lot more coordination around uh, dealing with urgent situations. There's a lot more coordination around uh, priorities in general for intelligence. There's a lot more coordination around uh, saying what assessment products the community needs. 
assessment products go towards the prime minister much more than they did in my period uh, to the point where foreign affairs has set up um, has set up or is setting up its own assessment capacity which i think is appropriate mm -hmm. so i think a lot of progress has been made but i think it's an unending task um, you're always looking for more coordination uh, and it's a long journey to get there you do sound very uh, optimistic, though, which is which is nice to see. I, I want to pick up on something, Greg, that you've referred to earlier and about the sort of the fact that threats are always mutating. There's always more threats coming down the path. And as we agreed, you know, the threats from the 80s and 90s, which we felt had gone away with the end of the Cold War, have re re emerged, especially in the, in the form of Russia. You were quoted in an article in the Globe and Mail uh, fairly recently with respect to COVID and the Canadian government response, this was back in February, and the title of the Global Mail article was Ottawa Must Address Mistakes Regarding COVID-19 Pandemic Preparedness. The breakdown of Canada's pandemic early warning system, which had its operations curtailed by the government less than one year before the outbreak hit, is an example of mistakes that need addressing. And you're quoted here as saying, whenever anybody looks at the history of the intelligence committee in Canada, 9-11 stands out as a turning point in terms of attention to security intelligence in terms of funding for agencies, in terms of reorganization of government. I think it's very pertinent, a very pertinent question to ask if this could be the same. Obviously, we are living in a very challenging time now with COVID in terms of what it's done to the economy, what it's done to people's lives. It's, 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 we're in an incredible part, uh, upheaval now. How do you see uh, you know, us preparing for future COVID, future pandemics, what is the role of intelligence going to look like, or what should it look like, rather, from your perspective, so that we're better prepared for when this comes again? Because we all know what's going to come again at some point down the point down down the line. Yeah, well, we were prepared before, and a lot of the machinery was uh, disassembled because it looked like uh, either we weren't going to have another major pandemic, or it would be in a form that we already knew that that would not be the catastrophe that we have actually experienced. Um, I think. First of all, I think um, the, the health agencies have to take the lead on preparing for pandemics. Uh, they, they have the expertise, they know what they're looking for. But I think what's clear is that the, the GFIN uh, capacity for uh, detecting danger signs uh, has been uh, reinstated and I think it has to be improved with, with a greater uh, reliance on modern open source technology. Um, but I think what we have to do from the intelligence community side is we have to make sure that the overall organization of government, uh, including the health agencies, is able to draw on intelligence material that's available as part of the warning function. And then the intelligence community um, has to develop expertise in seeing what the consequences of pandemics are. Uh, in fact, historically, uh, pandemics have had heavy, heavy national security consequences, whether we're talking about the 1919 flu or uh, earlier waves of disease, which were which were much more prominent before the modern era. So there are always intelligence uh, and security consequences on a national and a global basis. So we have to understand as intelligence assessors what those are likely to be. But we also have to be part of the warning network. Uh, and we have to have mechanisms that make sure that if we get interesting information, then it ends up in the hands of people who are assembling the whole picture uh, in, in the health agencies. Is there not also, though, a fear, though, Greg, that, you know, once we get past this and let's say, knock on wood, we don't have another pandemic for quite some time, that there's a typical government response that things get whittled away? And I'm, I'm thinking here, maybe it's a bad analogy, but you look at what happened after World War II, where in the after, immediate aftermath of 1945, uh, Canada had the fourth largest Navy in the world. We were one of the, you know, one of the more experienced militaries on the planet. And then, you know, throughout the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the whole thing basically just fell apart and, and it, it, because it wasn't seen as an urgent priority. Is there not a fear that we're going to see deja vu all over again? The government will say, well, been there, done that. We can probably take a little bit of money and resources away from this because we're not we're not so sure it's going to happen again. And, and, and of course, as you said earlier, around the cabinet table, everyone has their hands up for money and resources. So are we going to have this conversation again in 10 years time? No, I don't think we'll have it again in 10 years' time. I think this uh, pandemic has been so severe and the consequences have been so severe that it is burned in the memory of a whole generation, a generation being 20 to 25 years. If we get through 20 to 25 years without another 
a pandemic of, of this proportion, I think it's quite possible people will say, okay, um, it looks like we have escaped this. Um, but I think this lesson will last a long time. And I think the worst thing that happened, and, and I understand why governments uh, turn to current priorities rather than ones that have a, a historical dimension, um, but the worst, the worst judgment that that seemed valid was, okay, what, what is likely to hit us is something that looks like SARS. It's mm -hmm. going to be really dangerous. It's going to kill several thousand people. We'll have to shut down access to hospitals and we'll have to watch international travel, but it's not going to be 1919 all over again. Well, it's turned out to be closer to 1919 right. than to SARS. Right. And, and that's where the anticipation failed. And, you know, it's, it's impossible to say, but there are already predictions about what the less, the next pandemic could look like and where it'll come from, uh, with, with, uh, specific diseases outlined as the possibility, which scientists are, are hoping to defeat before it gets that far. So I think that, that there, there is uh, a diminution of memory as people change and as threats do not materialize. But I think this one was so severe that the memory will last vividly for at least a generation. Well, let's hope so. I would not want to have to say that we've had to relearn our lessons, uh, you know, down the road. Last question for you, Greg. I, I find that I, I get contacted by a lot of people who uh, express an interest in a career in intelligence or security intelligence in Canada. Any sort of last th thoughts or feelings on what it's like to work in intelligence in Canada and why more, you know, talented Canadians should look at this as a possible career choice? Uh, yeah, it's obviously it's, it's extremely important and it's extremely important that it's done well. Uh, it is fascinating in the sense that you get all kinds of problems at the global level, uh, the national level, even the local level. We have an intermingling of all kinds of problems now from, from the uh, uh, security dimension to criminality. They're all mixed together. Um, I, would say on the, I would say on the negative side that uh, I, I don't know how many thousands of conversations or presentations I've heard that every, everybody, in, everybody at the end said, well, that was depressing. <laughs> uh, and I would, say, I would say to people uh, who are, are looking at coming into the intelligence community, um, being interested in, in intelligence is not enough. You have to bring something specific. You have to bring knowledge of a country. You have to bring knowledge of a language. Uh, you have to bring technical skills. Um, people who are just interested in intelligence, yes, there's some openings, um, but increasingly uh, those who hire are looking for um, clearly defined expertise that can be brought to bear within the community. No, I don't, that, that gets really good. I, I, you know, we used to laugh at CSIS that there'd be a certain percentage of people who wanted to come to work for us because they'd seen one too many James Bond films and, and thought that's what it was really about. We have to keep saying that's not what things are. Greg, this has been a fascinating conversation, a look at uh, your, not just your career, but sort of your ability to sit back and take a look at the larger issues that are that Canada faces and how intelligence can help to resolve some of these issues. So I want to thank you very, very much, not just for joining me here today on the podcast, but for your, your years of dedication. And like I said, you said, you sound an awful lot like me. You don't sound very retired. You sound, you, and I, I'm very, very thankful. And I, and I think Canadians should recognize, you know, just the, the important contributions you're continuing to make, despite the fact that we, you know, we did hang up our hats uh, from officially working for the government. But, uh, but, but thanks for continuing to be such a presence. Yeah, it's, uh, it's too interesting to uh, totally let go. Well, again, thanks. Uh, so that was my conversation with Greg Fife, uh, an old friend of mine who worked for, in intelligence and has a lot to, to say about the importance of intelligence. What do you think of our conversation? You can reach me on email, borealisrisk at gmail.com or on Twitter at Borealis Saves. Find me also on LinkedIn and on Facebook. If you like the content, go to the website, borealisthreatenrisk.com. You can subscribe to all the content. There's also a link there to my new book, The Peaceable Kingdom, A History of Terrorism in Canada from Confederation to the Present. Uh, drop me a line. Love to hear your feedback. I'll talk to you again soon. Until then, stay safe.